All right, Steve, we are uh, we're back for another one, and uh, I think this week is going to be uh, we're going to go down some rabbit holes. I think this week, um, and you know, ironically, this kind of lines up some with uh, for those of you that are unaware. Steve has a book coming out soon, and, and those things um, it'll be up for pre order. We'll let everybody know, and we'll we'll pass those links around. But um, in relation to that some current events that are occurring in the workplace and in the future of work and, you know, the HR space and all these different things are unfolding that are a post event out of, um, you know, out of COVID-19 and those things. So um, if you want to kind of share with the viewers kind of what, what topic we literally picked about an hour ago and uh, how we're going to dive into it. Right on, Shane. Good to see you, man. And as usual, it is really hard for us in the show to sort of narrow down what meaningful topics we should go into. Yeah. And I think this one, I I chose this topic because you and I, we ping pong articles every day, probably three or four a day. And uh, they start distilling into, okay, this is a big one. And I think what I want to do is uh, get your views and dive into this whole notion of um, unemployment and wages and measuring how we measure unemployment, um, how how uh, we face this reality where in one article in particular is seeing that retail and the restaurant industry are facing uh, one of the steepest challenges they've ever faced to hire people. Wages are going up, big name companies, Amazon, McDonald's are going above the federal minimum wage, which is still, I think, $7.95. In some cases, going as high as fifteen, sixteen, seventeen dollars an hour, and they're still struggling to fill these jobs. And my first reaction when I saw that news was like, "Wow, I think maybe all the people that were doing those jobs had about six, nine, twelve months in some cases to sit home and look at the world differently and take stock at what they're doing and explore maybe some new opportunities." I think there's a whole pers perspective angle around stimulus checks, um, providing some different perspectives for people. Um, maybe people got unemployment and said, whoa, this unemployment checks more than I was making before. Um, so that's interesting. And then we, we also have, you know, this whole dimension of, um, you know, what does that mean for businesses? What levers are they going to pull to try to get people in? So anyway, that that's the landscape that I want to play in, and we could go lots yeah. of different places, and, oh, and we're probably not going to have time to cover everything. Yeah. Hmm. So 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 the so 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 let's let's actually I actually want to add a different frame to this as well, an extra frame. Cool. To cool. This right. So we just we just went through an election, um, and we're not going to get into politics, so don't shut us off. Um, <laughs> we, we we did we did we just went through an election, and a lot of a, a lot there was a few topics that were. Huge hot buttons, huge campaign notes, probably on both sides for different reasons. Things like uh, universal income, okay? Things like uh, universal health care. Things like raising the minimum wage, right? Things like lowering unemployment. What is wild is that COVID happens and is going to, what I think, in real time, we are seeing it formulate all of these things to play out to become an everyday part of society. So, so a, a virus, if you will, is going to do something that humans and politicians could not do. And that is create a, it's why, like, I, I don't want to go too far deep, but it's wild how this is happening. So, we, we saw many protests over the last four or five years of, of restaurant workers, mainly fast food workers is what I think it was kind of stereotyped as. Mm -hmm. We want more pay. We want more pay. And I've seen this, and, 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 I, and I think I actually talked to you about this when this article kind of first kind of came into our ecosystem, and I said, you know, I think people miss the mark when they say McDonald's workers first needed more pay. And that started post 2008, 2009, when the economy collapsed back then. And the reason is, is you had a group of people who were on the verge of retirement. They panicked. 
They pulled all their money out of their retirement thinking because the market crashed and then they didn't, you know, they, if they would have kept it in, they'd been fine. Actually, if they would have kept it in. They'd be really more than fine now. But mm -hmm. um, if they would have done this, they panicked and now they got to go work. Well, the jobs that were there before are gone. So now you got to go. You, I don't I hate to word it this way, but you got to kind of step down the qualification pole if you will, right? We all can, mm -hmm. anyone can walk in and get a restaurant job, right? We, we know that it doesn't take a, you have to have a good personality and manners, right? So and you got to show up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, 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 so now people are working. So, so what happened if you went over the last 12 years and you went to fast food restaurant, you started to notice that there were much more people that looked like your older aunt or your grandparents or your mom working in McDonald's, not, not, not like in a negative way, just it was an older demographic now working at McDonald's where historically when I grew up, it was a bunch of high school to early college kids in there working. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of always the joke. That's why the, you know, the running, the running joke that happens everywhere in the world at drive throughs of, uh, those young kids, they don't even know how to get my order right. Or, you know, the, you know, that thing, right. Now that's not the case. Now what we're seeing is we're seeing restaurants say, okay, we were all shut down. So now all those people now we're out of, out of a job again. Mm -hmm. so now those 40 to 55 year olds that were having to work in McDonald's, now they're out of a job. Restaurants shut down. Now they're in a position to now take other jobs that are now opening up where they're willing to, going back to our last episode, educate them to come in and work. Right. So now new opportunities have been created. But the ancillary part of this now is now those kids that weren't working see a different opportunity and say, wait a second, I don't know if I want to go flip burgers. Right. I don't know if that's what I want to do because Tesla said that they need 10,000 employees right out of high school. And working at Tesla, man, that sounds an awful lot better than going and working at Wendy's or McDonald's or Hardee's or mm -hmm. Carl's Jr. Mm -hmm. and going to school and taking out a loan because my mom wants me to, and she thinks I'm supposed to go to college. And I think that's one piece to all this. And I've went on a long rant. So I'm going to hand it back to you and kind of let you either rebut anything that I've said. Cause I, I, I don't necessarily have strong opinions. I'm just giving my observations um, because I've followed this for some time. Right. So if we try to take a look at this, there's one other dimension you, you didn't mention, but you call it out to me this week, which is, the measurement of how Americans are saving for retirement is going up. What? Yeah, the balance. I is, all these people were, yeah, the balance of, of money in retirement is going up. Like, what? How does that reconcile with unemployment, people losing jobs? Is it people being nervous about the future? So I better save, not spend this, uh, the stimulus checks I've got or our unemployment checks. That's another interesting piece. So if you've got a jump ball and you're in your 20s or you're in your teens and you say, okay, Tesla's over here. They're a, they're a disruptor. They're a market leader. They, I believe, probably have some career growth options in the future. Or I can go into restaurant work, fast food work, where there might not be as many options. It might not have the sex appeal that all my friends and family would be proud for me to work for. So there's not really much of a choice there, I think. I mean, it's a kind of, it's. I wouldn't say it's a no-brainer, but Tesla's not in as many locations as restaurants and retail. Sure. So that that's only going to be available to the cities that sure, sure. agreed to Elon Musk's terms to to build a big factory. Yep. You know, yep. Wherever that wherever that is. So so that's interesting to me. It's also interesting to see other firms around the country incre increasingly and we talked about this last week disregard the necessity for college, recognize that we need to offer development here. And now it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Are they going to attract at scale? So, and I do believe, and because I got a hunt, uh, you know, dozens of friends over 50 that are coming to me going, I'm not, you know, people aren't, I'm not sure people want to hire me. Ageism is out there and they're feeling like their options are limited. And I do feel like a Tesla is probably going to lean more towards where the younger people can learn faster and they're going to maybe tolerate us a little bit more than the older people will. <laughs> so we may bias towards hiring a younger worker than an older worker. So both of those parties are going to go that way. And then maybe we're going to see what you're seeing um, 
it's going to happen is fast food is the demographic working fast food is going to rise in terms of the average age, you know? What? So, so does that change? So, so does that also play into how the restaurant industry has been rapidly changing anyway from a, a, a traditional sit down model to what we call ghost kitchens? So this, mm -hmm. this whole phenomenon of ghost kitchens to where one warehouse builds a bunch of different kitchen spaces. And now they actually house seven, eight restaurants that are delivery only or right. pick up, pick up and delivery only. So it's these things of, do you need the same amount of employees? Well, if I don't have a front, you know, if I don't have a front seating capacity of 150 people, I don't need a bartender. I don't need five bartenders on staff. I don't need 12 greeters. I don't need I don't, good customer service skills necessarily because no, we're no. just taking orders via a, via a phone. Mm -hmm. It's just a product. It's right. just a product. There is no service involved in it. It's just mm -hmm. a product. Mm -hmm. So that for me, I, I just find it very, very interesting because youth unemployment is still high. It's higher than, than the other demographics, uh, age demographics. Um, the other piece to this, and you and I've talked about this, Yes, the retirement account age or the retirement account balances are as high on average in the United States as they've ever been. Now, we could say, well, the stock market has been on a tear of the last 18 months of the likes we've never seen, right? Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. you know, the, all these different things, but people are still unemployed. Um, and I remember something, and there was something like 60% in the first stimulus check of May of 2020, 60% of people making 35 to $75,000 invested part of their stimulus check into the stock market. So, and, and, and to the week prior when the checks hit stock market investing was up 90%. Like that's nuts in the middle of a pandemic when nothing is open, but they, so I don't like, what does that say about the behavior? Because ultimately, yes, our government sets the rules and, you know, the big corporations kind of decide how things happen or don't happen. But in reality, it's really us as the people. We decide how how the market actually goes. We're the consumer. Um, you know, the small business owner and the entrepreneur is becoming more and more important in our economy. So did they do that because they said, oh, well, we think that it's going to come back. So we're not concerned. Mm -hmm. Were they just, you know, or was it was it ignorance? Was it foresight? Was it like, what was it? in that process. And I think that, I think, I think it's an amazing thing that we're coming out of this and it's changing things. Right. It, 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 it's, it's changing like COVID-19 happened and it, and it, and it rocked the world in mm -hmm. your words. It, 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 it earthquake, it work quaked the world. Right. Yeah. Yep. And now we're having these tremors that come out of this, of these ancillary things that happen. And one of those is the restaurant industry is changing. Restaurants now are openly saying, we're not, we're not arguing against, we don't need the federal government to tell us what we're going to pay you. We're going to pay you more. We're going to double right. that, you know, mm -hmm. and is that attractive? If people are, if they're willing to pay $20 an hour to work at McDonald's and people won't go work there, is that an indictment on the industry or is there something else happening? Right. And that's what I'm trying. That's what I want to uncover. I want to uncover that. And I think this is, you know, I work with, just like you, I work with dozens of entrepreneurs, business leaders around the world, and we are still starting to surface how the pandemic has changed everyone's perspective on work and life. And sitting home for a year plus, I'm looking at the world differently. I don't miss the commute. I don't, I love having dinner with my family, or I don't like spending all this time with my spouse or, you know, on and on and on. And I think the one of the parts of this retail challenge and restaurant industry challenge of recruiting that's interesting to me is if they're hiring a, an older worker, the older worker's needs are different than the younger yes. worker. Yes. And so how are you, are you ready for that? Because you built a whole foundation. Now, you, you can let go the lobbyists in Washington, D.C. who are arguing to keep the minimum wage low. Because you don't you don't need to fight that you're that's not a, a battle you want to fight anymore. Now it's like holy no. crap, yeah. We need to convert those lobbyists into recruiters, and yep. we got to figure out how we're going to do this. And maybe yeah, maybe our business model is changing while all that's happening. We got to we got to get warehouses so we're just making food for delivery. 
Um, I mean, I don't know about you, Shane, but when I go to fast food and I, you know, say what you want about McDonald's, I love McDonald's. Okay. Like I hey. am no stranger to McDonald's. Okay. okay. <laughs> but I, I'm never, I'm never, um, I guess I'm continually surprised. There's a whole section now for the delivery, home delivery people, you know, and in my neighborhoods, DoorDash runs the table. Right. But okay. I've been other places okay. where it's Uber. Okay. It's like, I'm okay. just like, wow, that's just, and that's, that table is busy, you know, almost busier than, you know, having to go in with your mask and sit down and in, in, yep. in the places around here where we're still masking up. And that's just fascinating to me. And, and I can see why some of these retail, if I was in fast food, like, whoa, okay. Minimum wage is one thing, but now I got to deal with home delivery and those people are eating my margin and Uber's asking for 20, 30, 40% and door and, and DoorDash and all these other people. Like I got to figure out, should I hire my own delivery people? Is that a model that I want to get into? I don't know. It's just yeah. interesting, you know? Yeah. And I remember when Domino started, I was in college at the time and I was like, this is awesome. And we used to call them in my, in my, where I went to college, we used to call them squirrel killers. Cause those cars were driving everywhere, killing yeah, yeah, squirrels yeah, 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 on yeah. the streets. And I remember that was like revolutionary and that was in the eighties, but no one else has been doing the delivery like pizza has yeah. for, for decades. Correct. Correct. So, so here, here's something wild, right? Um, something else that happened over the last eight or nine years is we were, um, we were told this horror story about what is to come in the future of work, right? And a, and a really smart guy that I know, um, says the future of work is not about robots and AI and automation. The future of work is about being more human, right? Now you said this, yep. right? Long before you've been saying this, mm -hmm. even before COVID happened, yep. right? So you've been saying this and that's what we're dealing with. We're not talking, notice this, none of this conversation, no article anywhere is saying we aren't hiring people. We are not bringing people in. We don't need these 10,000 people. We're saying we don't have enough people. We need more people in. And guess what? Some of the some of the companies that everybody thought was going to not have any humans walking around, the Amazons, the Teslas of the world. Guess what? Amazon just said they're hiring 50,000 people at something like a minimum a minimum starting salary of 20,000 or $20 an hour. Wow. So we're not talking like, like you hit the nail on the head, even long before I knew you, you mm -hmm. hit the nail on the mm -hmm. head. It's we're not like robots aren't taking over the world. They're only going to change how we work. Not if we're going to work, right? This isn't a scary thing. So now being a good human and a good leader actually matters because now people are saying, I'm not going to come work for this asshole here who treats people like garbage. I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful about what, how you frame that Shane is we thought those frontline jobs in retail and restaurants were going to be replaced by AI and robots. That was all the media was talking about. Oh yeah. You know, 60%, you know, 50% of the jobs in 10 years don't even exist today. Um, and there's some truth to some of that, but no one's talking about, oh, you the same people that said robots and AI are taking over everything are going, wow, look at, uh, look at this. It's amazing. All these human needs that are, um, really concerning businesses right now. And I think, and that's what, you know, we could go down a, a rat hole on this one. This is my biggest problem with business leaders today. And I was having a conversation with some people last night on this. You know, uh, what's the, what tool or technology can help solve the recruiting problem, Steve? I'm like, you're looking at this the wrong way. Yeah. Your if mirror. You, that's yeah, right. Go look in the mirror. That's right. We, you know, if you keep looking for a tool, keep asking yourself, has email made your life any better? Because that was yeah. the tool that was going to help us communicate better. Has it made it better? No. Cause we're all behind now and we're all speaking about stuff that we don't need to be speaking about and writing about. So so I think it is a, we need to shift back to our roots. Good news is we're human. We know how to be human. And, and I think we need to shape this conversation a little bit differently. And that, and I'm glad you brought out the fact that you're going to hire 50,000 people. Do you, the first question I have, if you ask me for help on that is, do you know how to, you know how to manage 50,000 people? Do you know how to engage yeah. 50,000 people? Do, are you ready for that? Because the, the act of recruiting 
is not the act of leading and keeping and engaging and thriving. It's di completely different. And, and so I would ask you, are you ready for that? Like you're going to go to play this on, on this massive scale. It's not about hiring people. <laughs> that is the easy oh. part actually. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so this goes back to a poll that I put out a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I said, coming out of COVID-19 is leadership development needed now more than ever. And I think it was like 95% said yes and 5% said no. Mm -hmm. And that's, it couldn't be beyond, like it, it's probably needed now more than maybe anything. Mm -hmm. Because now if you're going to tell us that, okay, McDonald's, you're going to hire some people out. You've been, you haven't really had to manage anybody over the last 12 to eight months. So, and we know you've done the math. You've looked at the numbers. People are changing jobs now at a quicker rate than ever. So now you've got turnover. So now there's no legacy yep. culture. There's like, it, it's not what it is. So now you better have a, you better, you better build up a really, really good management support team within your company so that they don't go anywhere. Otherwise, as the CEO, you're about to have to do a whole bunch of stuff that you really don't want to do. And that's other people's jobs because you're going to be paying people that aren't capable and aren't able to do that job. Mm -hmm. And, and I can only imagine in a big company that costs millions of dollars in pro productivity. It, it, it has to. Yeah. So now we're seeing these things. There, there was another Another study done on 3,000 employees at places like Google, Facebook, um, JP Morgan, these different things. And, and, they, and, and these employees said they would rather permanently work from home than get a $30,000 a year raise. And this all kind of ties into all of this. People have choice. They saw, like you said, and I said this during the pandemic, there's a lot of people about six months into the pandemic that found out that they really did not want to be married. They mm -hmm. were like, holy cow, who is this <laughs> human that I've been living with? Right. Because now I'm stuck. I can't right. go to work. I can't go hang out with my buddies. I can't go see my girlfriends. I can't go, mm -hmm. you know, I can't, you know, I can't do, you know, my, the things I did that kind of caused that intermittent time in between. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it and it goes back to there's a there, there's a there's actually a psychological study done on empty nesters or when people retire and one per now they're stuck at home with just them and just that dynamic for so long it was other people involved and it was a different dynamic and there's an actual mourning process that occurs when people retire and they both are at home and that hap we were forced to all deal with that you either found right. out you had a really strong marriage. Or you had a shitty marriage. You found that right. out really quick. Right. And your life pattern changes. So what I see among um, you know people who are empty nesters for the first time, they've been spending all their weekends driving the kids here and there, you know, organizing, having the kids as a, in, you know, the rhythm of life was engaging with the kids and engaging with your spouse. Now the kids are gone and now it's like just us, we've changed or did we, you know, did the compatibility, did the connection still last? And yeah. is it going to weather that new frontier? And this is fascinating to me. And, and, and what is really the, the big aftershock uh, is what I call it from COVID. What's, what's really raw and intense about what we're going through right now. It's not just work that changed. It's everything that changed. And I think that's such an exciting, optimistic landscape for all of us to, to front to confront such as the point you made people recognizing to have more choice people recognizing i can create some income through other sources that i never thought i had to because now i was forced to because i lost my job or i was furloughed or i was working from home for a long time i realized more of what's possible i realized where i am in my relationship i realized how i a different outlook on work for example one study i've seen is women significantly would rather stay and work from home, then go back into the office. And I'm like, okay, how are we going to reconcile? How's that going to play? That's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. And there's a very talented labor pool there and organizations, if they want to attract, and, and meanwhile, they're getting pulled for, hey, you need a more diverse workforce. You need more gender equity. Yep. You know, good. Now you've got a 
go get that talent that is demanding a different sort of work scenario than before in ways that's before. Add on to that, every employee in the world now has a different definition of safety. So, hey, Shane, we got a meeting next week. Our 50 people are going to get together. It's a really critical uh, strategy brainstorm. It's at 2 o'clock. And you're like, whoa, 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 time out. Um, I've got a member of my family that's going through some treatments right now. And there's no way I'm going to be around 50. Uh, you call them employees. I call them germ carriers. You know, And that's you just reframed your sense of personal safety. So now we got to you know, account for that. We got to account for, well, are we going to let people, if some people are working from home, should we even have a meeting with people in the same room as part of that meeting? Because maybe yep. it won't be as productive. So this whole ocean has changed. We got undertoes pulling all different directions. And you know, that's why I say the best practice right now is experimentation. We don't know how this is going to play. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think McDonald's, for example, has a real opportunity. Older workers don't leave jobs as fast as younger workers. That's a fact. So maybe you're going to, and that's probably one of their biggest problems. Always got to be training, always got to be hiring. Like maybe that'll slow down. Maybe they're going to go, wow, the hourly wage is up, but our costs for labor are down because we're having to recruit less. Maybe they're going to stumble on something like, whoa, we always thought we need to go for the teenagers. These 40 and 50 year olds, they're killing it and we're making more money. So there could be some upsides that we don't even see right now. And, and, and you hit on something and I think, and I think that's, I think it's absolutely vital. And I know we have a lot of business and professional folks, um, that, that follow what we do. Um, and maybe some of them run with our advice. Hopefully it all works out, but, um, you know, it, it's how, how, like, how do you, like, I guess, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, okay, this change occurred and, the experimentation has to happen. Historically, historically, business owners and CEOs, historically, I'm not, I'm not putting everybody in a box, but historically, they are very conservative. Um, I don't want to say scared, but if the, the old, like, I think they kind of invented the motto, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Well, now it's broke. And, and, and yeah, you were successful. And there's a lot of people that think that way. It's the same type of people that, you know, try to, you know, shame the younger generation of, well, you've had seven jobs and you're 25 years old. You're going to, yeah. you're going to have any loyalty or figure out what you want to do. Well, when the reality of it is most 45 year olds don't know what they want to do with the rest of their life. So how do, how do, how does that change? How does that fundamentally change? Like, I mean, is, is it, is it going to be hard? I mean, obviously it's going to be hard lessons for some, but how do people, because you're, you are the exception and not the norm as I've researched back as our relationship has grown. And, 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 and when I, what I mean by that is you saw the reality of what's happened now in a way that is playing out in real time. Whereas most other people were fear mongering and trying to predict, you know, the, the robot takeover. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so I'm sure you've given this some thought, how does a person develop, is it workplace empathy? Is it just I, like, what, like what, what, it, what, what is it? How do they, how are we going to change to say, I, I'm got to just try stuff. How do I get my board to be okay with, you know, uh, what we did six months ago isn't working now. And you're just going to have to ride this wave with me because, I, we're just gonna. I'm gonna lean on them. We're gonna try some of their ideas. I'm gonna try some of your ideas. I may even put a poll out on LinkedIn. I'm gonna try some different ideas. I, I, I gotta try, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. right, because I think if we don't try, you're you're gonna like. It, it, I don't think it's gonna end well for for a business if they don't try. I don't yeah. think. Yeah. So when I think about this, we've built a whole system that's designed to produce stability, predictability, and reliable outcomes. And that's what board of directors want. As you said, when you frame this whole discussion, that's what CEOs generally want. Like, I want to know that I'm designing this to produce a reliable outcome. And what I, what I say in coaching leaders and companies today is, unfortunately, I got some bad news for you. What you need to design for right now is instability your ability to navigate the unpredictability that we all know is coming. 
whether it is another strain of the virus, whether it is another economic recession, whether it is, you know, trade wars with China or hacks from Russia, you need to design for instability, which means you need a workforce that can adapt and be agile. And that means you need to find people who can adapt and be agile. And sometimes people who didn't go to college have learned to adapt and be agile more than people that are just following the roadmap of that. I'm going to college. I, I, I'm guilty of that because that's what you do. I didn't go there and sharpen my knife of solving deals in the back alleys. No, I went there because that's what I thought you should do. And so that's the big reframe right now. And the only way that I can, that I've tried to uh, help leaders, like the big question that you said is how are we going to reframe people to realize this is really yeah. about experimentation is, and, and again, the, there's a lot of technology, um, um, folks out or anti-technology folks out there that are thinking, you know, Silicon Valley, I'm tired of this, but listen, I sat in this place for about 25, 30 years. And what they've done really good is learn how to operate in crazy Silicon Valley and software is an experiment. That's what software is. You know, that's why I love doing HR for technology companies because the software engineers are like, it's alpha beta. We try a, we try B, we see what works and we go with a or B, whichever works. That's what we got to do with leadership. And software is, you know, who is it? Was it Bill, Bill Gates or somebody said software is going to eat the world? Or maybe it was oh, yeah, Mark yeah, Andreessen. Yeah, 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 I think so. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is the this is the example that I give. Let's take a look at any high performing technology company, whether it's Uber, Snap, Airbnb, Microsoft, Oracle, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Do you know what the average tenure is and or the median tenure is in those organizations? Less than two years. Every single one. I think Tesla right now is like 2.3. And you can find that on LinkedIn. It's right there. 2.3 years. One of the most sophisticated technology companies in the automobile industry. And I don't even know if you could call them an autom automobile industry. They may be an energy play. Yeah. But the, how can you look at that and not go, what's going on there? It's crazy. People are leaving. It's moving. It's a big, it's, it's a big experiment. That's working for them. You know, there's a lesson that we need to learn for big companies. And it has for years. Right. And, and so, so, so that's where I was going with this. And I'm, and I'm kind of throwing you a, a, an alley, an alley you <laughs> here in, in, a, in a lot of ways, but, but this is, this is where people get. So, so I live in Kentucky. I'll, I'll, I'll frame this again for anybody who's not listening. As we know, this side of the Mississippi, we look at Silicon Valley and we, somehow turn our nose as if they're not working hard or they just don't get it. It's not real America. And and I'll be honest, over the last 20 years, there's been an era of that, right? Like mm -hmm. the things that you guys were doing in Silicon Valley, they weren't going to work in Louisville, Kentucky. They weren't going to work. But guess what? They will now because you don't have a choice and you went through this. So So in reality, if you're if you have this business and you don't know how to be comfortable in experimentation, you better find somebody like Steve or other people out there that exist who have lived, eat and breathe and help build this culture within Silicon Valley to come in and give you some guidance and some insight that you can trust. Otherwise, you're going to be out in the middle of a ocean, a ocean <laughs> rowing a rowing a boat with one paddle. Like you're not like you might get there or you might die of exhaustion trying to get there. And, yeah. and and you guys lived it. And I don't mean to like, this isn't like to hype you up. It's the reality. This is why I wanted to talk about this because mm -hmm. everything you went through is now necessary everywhere in the world, whether it's Bogota, Colombia, whether it's Madrid, Spain, whether it's Auckland, New Zealand, or Shanghai, China things learned about how to scale and not get stressed when you walk in and you've got to hire 65 people in a week or 155 people in two weeks or whatever these crazy numbers are. Mm -hmm. That's why we as, Amer as, as regular population in the world, I say we, I'm not me, but People will read an article and see Amazon needs to hire 50,000 people. A lot of people look at that and they say, oh my gosh, how are they going to do? There's no way. There's no way. They know exactly how they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. They know what they're, they've been doing it. This is what yep. they do. This is what's happened. They have multiple people on staff who have done this before. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why people like you, like, it, like that's why I enjoy having these conversations with you because we're able to peel back and relate. Not just you, because there's other people out there like you. Not a lot, but there's other people out there who've kind of done and achieved the things you've done. There is that in here. And I just think that it's so much, it's so valuable. It's your insight and people who've been through that stuff now being uncomfortable. That startup culture that we all, I was a part of it. You beat your chest and you say, you better get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, corporate America better be comfortable with the uncomfortable. And now you got it. Now you got to take in our culture. Yeah. And what's interesting, Shane, is I don't think Silicon Valley set out with a plan. We're going to be change warriors. We're going to do things differently. I don't think that's how it all started. Yeah. But that's how it's evolved. And just like at, at LinkedIn, where we built a phenomenal culture, no, none of us woke up one day and said, hey, our key to success is going to be building a culture. I mean, I literally stood with the CEO, Jeff Wiener, one day when he looked at me and he said, I never would have guessed culture was going to be our competitive advantage. But we had to experiment. We had to try new things because Google was killing us on recruiting and we were selling our products so Google could beat us in recruiting, which was even more ironic. And Facebook and Twitter and all these sexier brands force competition. And that's why I sort of have this you know, se seduction for working and living here because the idea is the competitive landscape forces new ways of thinking. And they, you know, I don't think uh, Silicon Valley deserves the credit for coming, pioneering with like an experimentation culture, but it's where it's happening. It's going here and people have, don't appreciate on the outside that really, is, you know, the way that ideas can move and grow is so fast because nobody's sitting in their job 10 or 20 years they're all Lou and they're, they're all new to a role and they're hyped with energy and they're super jacked up because they're taking on more responsibility than they have any right to do. And these big companies are approaching it the wrong way. Oh, you, before you can be invited to the meeting, you got to work here like 10 years and earn your stripes. Like, really? That's how you're going to innovate? And you're I'll give never, you never going to have anybody there. <laughs> That's right. And I'll give you a story. I'm working with a client, a, a multinational conglomerate. They've got thousands of people in dozens of countries and they say, hey, can you come in and teach us about the future work? And then they sort of said, well, what are you going to tell us? And I'm like, well, workers are seeing the world differently. People aren't staying as long. Your competitive advantage is trying to help you know, grow your talent. Don't promise them long-term employment. Promise you're going to make them better and expect they're going to leave. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We can't do that because what we're doing is really complicated. <laughs> and so we need people here a long time. And I was like, I'm looking at their business and it's not, I'm like more complicated than what Google's doing, more complicated than what Tesla's doing. And they're like, well, I said, because those people aren't staying more than two years over there. And they're, they just, the jaw, it was like, they couldn't process that information. Like we built this company that people stay here a long time and it's about pensions. And, and I'm like, well, I, you know, okay. I can, they're like, can you tell us what big companies like us are doing, Steve? I'm like, no, I can't. And if that's what you want, you pick the wrong person to help you out. Yeah. Uh, if you want, do you want to be a market leader or do you want to be a market follower? Sure. I could go find what other big companies like you are doing and, you know, slow moving and not being aggressive and innovative, but that's not what I think you need to hear. And yeah. so they finally came around. I mean, it took about an hour and I finally, it's like, you want that? No, you don't want that. And they said, yeah, you're right. We don't want that, but it was uncomfortable. And that's why change is hard because making that shift is going against so many things you built, the infrastructure, the 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 informal culture, you know, that that's written down like we have to do it this way. It takes a while. And I and I get it. it's not easy. As a leader, it's gonna take some humility and it's gonna take some vulnerability to go in front of your people or publicly say, you know, I said I'd never do this, 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 and this, but I'm gonna be honest with you. Right now, we need to do this, 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 and this. We have to. And it's okay. Like it's right. like Silicon Valley is going through their own battle with this too. Now where the free dinners and the free meals aren't sexy. The massage therapist in the office isn't sexy. Mm -hmm. The, mm -hmm. you know, the, the dental office and the, you know, in the office isn't that stuff isn't sexy anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't need that when, well, I don't want that because I want, I'd rather work from home. I don't right. want $30,000 more a year, $30,000 more a year to the average American. That is a massive amount of money. Right. They're saying, no, you keep your money. I want to enjoy my time where I'm working and yeah. I enjoy it more at home. And what we're also seeing is product productivity isn't falling off. That big fear of oh, well, they're going to be working home and I can't monitor them and I can't keep up with what they're doing. Productivity is not falling off. I will bet 
I'll make a prediction. 24 months from now, we're going to look back and we're going to see productivity actually increased. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I've worked from home and or for myself every day for the last 14 years. So it is hard. It is difficult. You got to change. You got to you got to you got to keep yourself from not overworking. You got to you got to not you got to figure you got to know when to shut it off. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that humility has to be there for a leader. Um, I think with all of this change, it's kind of like saying like like that like that that story you said where they're like, well, what are the big companies doing? Well, the big companies, let's like they're doing what's worked for them for 50 years. Right. Mm -hmm. That would be like going to the doctor and say, well, what would you have told somebody 20 years ago? That's what I want. You, that's how I want you to fix me. I don't want you to fix me with the new information that you got right now and the new <laughs> stuff you got right now. I don't want that. That's not what I want. Or 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 even more so, what is going to work for you? And, and you've mentioned this a couple of times on these podcasts. You have to know who you are. You have to know your company. You have to know your people. If you don't know your people, how are you ever going to prescribe the fix? Mm -hmm. And and that's a lot of what has to happen. And and it's and it's all playing out. And this is really wild. And this really isn't I don't think this is going to be an episode of us making any like bold stances on anything. It's mm -hmm. just continuing the conversation. And I think us wanting to be on record to say, Hey, like we, we see these things. And I think this will create some conversation for a lot of our community as well of, of the increase of people who continue to follow what we do and chime in and share. And, 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 yeah. and, and let me reinforce what you just said, Shane, around th this time feels sign, you know, boldly unsatisfying because we have less in our control than we've ever had. And it just, it feels like we're, we're not gaining ground. It feels like we're losing ground. It feels like we're losing control. And that's uncomfortable. And when all that weird stuff's going on in the home life too, and everything's shifting, you know, we're less in control. And as humans, we want to be in control because we're here to survive. And the more things out of our control, the more the stress, anxiety, depression, rises and we're seeing that we're seeing that play out and you know the yeah. dependency on all those um in the drugs that we that we've seen to sort of numb our numb our senses it's, it's intense it's really intense so absolutely that that's contributing to a real awkward and that's why i give people grace when they're not changing as fast as i want to like i wanted to start you know sort of cold cock some of these people in the meeting i was having in that big conglomerate like wake up people <laughs> like yeah. come on you, you know, you want to follow, you want me to tell you all these other companies so you can follow and continue following. Didn't you find me because you want me to give you something new um, and something different? And I think there is hope, you know, and, and that's where I hope that our conversations really uh, help people sort of untangle the complexity here because we can't say everything's going to be okay. We no. can't say everything, but the message that you landed earlier, that was sort of a, a reinforcement of some things that I've been saying, which is, you know, the future is about being more human. It's not about being a robot. And don't let those pro prognosticators around the robots and AI come and get to your head. Because look at the data right now. There's tons of humans that are in need more than ever before in a time when you would think the army factory of robots would be uh, in full production, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think now more than ever, if if you don't, as a leader, if you don't possess the skills of empathy, of vulnerability and self-awareness, you're going to struggle the next 18, 24 months. And, um, you know, even if you, even if you don't own, hone all of them, if you just have enough self-awareness to realize I suck and I need to bring somebody in here who will help me care about these people because mm -hmm. I, I'm, because that, that's the only way because it, COVID-19 was a traumatic event. As, as you just hit on, it is a traumatic event. It, it is it has led to other things. Again, we'll see that data play out over the next couple of years. But we gotta we gotta help people in trauma, and mm -hmm. the workplace has become more than a place of. And it goes back to a previous episode again, more of a place of just clocking in and clocking out and coming and doing your job. This is much more than that now, mm -hmm. and whether you want it to be or not, that. The, the market has said you don't have a choice if right. you want if you want to adapt for the future of work because you can have right. all the technology and apps and computers and 
all mm-hmm. those things in place. You, we're seeing you still have to have human beings working there. And you That's better right. be able to treat them as they individually need in a way that will help keep you pushing forward and teach and, and, and enriching them. There's got to be almost like I've been looking for the word or the phrase to, to tie this in. And we've talked about, you know, educating, but it's almost like, in, like, like continuous employee enrichment. Like there has to be like this, it's like even maybe beyond education. It has to be, maybe we got to step into a space of realizing that I just had 10 workers come back to my office and this is massively traumatic. So not only am I going to give you off early on Fridays, but I'm going to give it to you and we're going to cover you some therapy or some counseling for that time. So you don't have to worry about that. And Mm -hmm. you have these things in place because I want to make sure you're good. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm doing it so that my business is good, but I care about you and I want to make sure you're good. Mm -hmm. And if, Mm -hmm. and if, and if you're not, then we need to know so we know how we can continue to help you. That's right. And that's part of the human component of this. We have to care for the whole individual now. And I, I don't think businesses disregarded it uh, before, but it wasn't as necessary as, it, as it is now. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, and we saw that here in the, in the Valley over the years, you know, on site, you know, therapists, doctors, medical, dental care, you know, it's all, it's, it's coming in. And then we just had the merger, uh, forced on us by the by covid sure and so and 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 that's a really great point like if you're a leader right now and you are not checking in with your people not about their numbers and, and how they're doing meeting their quota and their goals for the month and and you're not starting by saying how are you how are you first i think you're i think you're going to find fewer people answering your phone calls absolutely you you mentioned you mentioned something in the last conversation we had off air um about how you um kind of had become numb, if you will, to the, the phrase employee engagement. Mm-hmm. And I think, and, I, and, and as you were just saying that, mm-hmm. it maybe what we actually need is leadership engagement. Are our mm-hmm. leaders actually engaged with our team? Are, are our leaders actually engaged with the culture of what's going on? Mm-hmm. Are, are, because, you know, like, th- like that's what we need now. We, mm-hmm. Like, like our, our people are here. They're engaged. They showed up. They're here. They, they decided to come. To, they logged on today. Mm-hmm. So are you engaged as a leader? Are you tapped in? Are you aware of what's going on? Don't put the onus on our people who are carrying this burden for us. Let's actually do a self checkup on us, right? Are, right? are we good? Like, and you've done that with me. I've, you know, we went through some things this week and, you know, again, I, I appreciate all of it. And you checked in like, Hey, how, how's everybody on your end? Is everybody good? Is everybody yep. there? You yep. as a business partner were like, Hey, I want to make sure that he's good. I didn't ask you to, I didn't, you know, I, and I wasn't mm-hmm. hitting you like overly emotional. Like it's a bad, like, no, it <laughs> right. was just, it was just, but you did that out of the kindness as who you are as a human being. And that's what we got to have more of that. It just, yeah. it, 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 leadership is what we need. I believe that maybe I'm wrong and you might disagree, but leadership right now is what needs the attention. It is not our people because if leadership, it's, it's like you or me, if dad is good and in a good mood and everything's going good and we don't have any money problems and things are good at our household. I mean, the reality of it is everybody else in the house is kind of bouncing around like the world's all, you know, bubble gum and lollies, no matter how much money Mm -hmm. we actually have, no matter whatever, if we're good, everybody else is good. It's the same Mm -hmm. way with leadership in business. It's, it's Mm -hmm. the same way. Yeah. And, and what's sad, I think right now is uh, technologies here, I believe to enrich our human connection. And I feel technology is not achieving that goal for us. We are using technology to isolate. Um, I, you know, gave my kids iPads a, f- a few Christmases ago and I, they don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> that's not true, but that's how sure. it feels sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and they, they, they just self-absorb. And I think we, this, this whole COVID maybe is sort of like the reset, like, poof, you know, like the defibrillator of life in a way, sort of like, let's have a different electrical pulse. Let's connect differently. I'm an extrovert. It's been really hard for me. I want to high five and hug people. 
Um, and I'm looking yeah, forward to that too. more and more. You know, we, there's rumors that we're, you know, you know, if you've been, if you got the vax, you can, you can go maskless. And I also like to read body language. Can't see faces. That's been yep. hard, you know. Yep. And and I think it is the it's a big challenge. But there, we're seeing a lot of really good stuff. I believe that's going to come out of it. And and I think we got to take advantage as much as we can to appreciate the, you know, ability to connect and spend more quality engaging time together. And I, I love your idea of sort of, let's look at the leadership. You know, engagement is so tired for me because we've been, uh, people have whole businesses around helping employee engagement. The number hasn't moved for years. It's like 30% is the highest number we've ever hit of employee engagement. That's like a crisis and it's been coming up for years. So everyone's just sort of like, whatever. I think a bigger conversation should be along the lines of what you mentioned. Do you feel safe at work and do you feel trusted and do you trust the leaders you're working for? And leaders need to ask themselves about their own organization because they're engaged. In, if they don't feel the management's got the senior management's got their back, and they're just a pawn to take the hit for for the executives, they're out. And so this is a. T I mean, we have more choice right now. Professionals, by and large, have more choice. You said that earlier. I can completely agree. So if you have more choice, why would you go to a place where you're not feeling trusted, or you don't trust other people? Like you're not going to go there. And so that's why I love what we're going through because it's game on companies, Absolutely. game on, step it up. Yeah. People have choice. You, you can't, you know, um, market your, your uh, game, your way into being a place to good place to work anymore. Yes. Yeah. You real. actually have to walk the walk instead of just talking the talk. You mm -hmm. actually like, cause it's, cause now you're going to have people, here's what's wild. You're going to have people that are going to show up for an interview and the CEO won't be there for the interview. And that person hiring the job is. If you're going to hire me before you hire me, I'd like to have a conversation with the CEO. And, and they're going to be like, uh, well, we don't normally, well, okay, fine. <laughs> no problem. Right. Because I want to know, I want to talk to this guy who's going to be deciding how my daily life goes every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you get, so, so if you know, those things are coming, be on the forefront of it. Yeah. Be like, be forward of it. If you don't like, if you like, and I'm again, I'll use you as an example. If you know you're missing some of this empathy, if you know you're missing the the agile, empathetic, and authentic leadership that is necessary to succeed, then you got to find somebody like Steve who have been through this, who have seen this, and and bring those people in um, because it, it, you're, you're it, it's it's you owe it to yourself, you owe it to your board, you owe it to your customers, and you owe it to your team. And not in any particular order, but you owe it to all those people. And you owe it to your family at home because it's going to reduce your stress. It's going to reduce your anxiety and your angst. Let's mm -hmm. get, let's, let's figure out leaders. If you're listening, let's figure out a way to start engaging leadership engagement. Let's figure right. out if our leaders are engaged. So if you're a leader, you don't have to publicly comment on this, but inbox Steve or I and say, Hey, you're right. I did a little checkup from the neck up and, uh, um, you know, I'm not checked in and, uh, that dog, mm -hmm. that dog won't hunt. Right. So, let me give now, you a, let me give you a litmus test, Shane, for any leaders listening. This is how you know whether you're engaged or not. When you're interviewing someone for a job, if you're asking them about their qualifications and trying to see if they fit the job, um, that's part <laughs> of, that's part of being engaged. Yeah. It's not until you ask, tell me about how this job fits into your career journey. Tell me about your your career arc and all the decisions you've made, why you left a company, and how this fits in, and where you see this taking you. That's engaged because now you're seeing the whole person on the other side, and you want to making sure you're caring for them while they're going to potentially work for you. You're not checking the box to hire someone just because they meet the criteria. That's sort of like example one, and I and I tell it to recruiters and leaders all the time. If you're just hiring for qualifications. You're, that's like forty percent of what you need to be doing. Yeah, yeah. And and how do we actually in a in a technology world now? Again, I'm putting my best version of myself in front of you from my qualification standpoint. Find out actually who I am as a person. Let's actually figure out if I'm the right person for the job. Right? right. You know. And are you the right person for me? On you know on the other on the other side of it. So, man. Um, so a side note. Um, one of our are really, really, really uh, long or uh, dedicated listeners, if you will. Um, she's from the South. I won't use her name. She, she mm -hmm. hasn't give, given me permission to throw her name out there, so I won't, I won't put the spotlight on her. But 
Uh, she does comment on a lot of our posts and a lot of these snippets. Um, she did ask me to somehow finally squeeze in this um, uh, this phrase that dog won't hunt. She she picks up a lot of a lot of my southern mm-hmm. uh, southern. So I was able to squeeze it in here at the very end. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mention it to her because I want to see if she actually listens and, and checks in. But that's that's why. In case you wonder why I just randomly threw that in, that was uh, yeah. No, that's great. It reminds me of a game. One time I was sitting in a like a big executive staff meeting and someone said the word like some word that just wasn't in the flow. It's like cornucopia. <laughs> and then they had a funny look on their face after and they kind of looked at someone else across the room. And after uh, we leave the room and I'm like, what the hell was that? And he goes, well, we had a we had a bet five bucks that I could fit cornucopia <laughs> into the executive staff. Meeting. Oh, <laughs> that's called, man. That's called meeting bingo. And sometimes yeah. people challenge themselves with like really bizarre uh, challenges to keep the meeting fun and to keep sure. someone's attention. But sure. yeah, I appreciate you looking out for one of our listeners. Yeah, no, she, um, she, she gives a lot of really, really good insight and, and shares everything out. So I think that's, uh, it's important to, awesome. again, it's, it's, it's being aware of our, of our audience and, you know, giving them something that they, uh, that they ask for. So, uh, Steve, I tell you, this has been great. This has been really, really good. I think there's a lot of nuggets that are going to come out of this. Um, and I think overall the conversation was one that, uh, hopefully, like you said, hopefully gives some different perspectives and some different insight from two guys who are very different, but very similar. And, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been another, another good episode. Yeah. Thanks Shane. And thank you listeners for following us. Uh, this is the work week after hours with Steve Cadigan and Shane Howard. That's right. We look forward to your comments. We look forward to your follows. Please share this with your friends, with your community, and let us know what you think if there's other topics you'd, you'd like us to cover, and we really appreciate you.